from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by the following. West Virginia University, online at wvu.edu. AARP West Virginia, your ally for real possibilities in the Mountain State. Online at aarp.org slash wv. The West Virginia Higher Education Policy Commission, working to double the degrees produced annually in our state by 2025 through increased opportunities for West Virginians to earn the credentials today's economy demands. The High Technology Foundation, building a stronger West Virginia, online at wvhtf.org. At the legislature today, senators get their first look at a bill to get rid of the permitting requirement to carry a concealed weapon. Members of the House of Delegates vote on a bill to allow ride-sharing companies like Uber or Lyft to operate in West Virginia. And we focus in on the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, a bill that's causing a statewide conversation. Those stories and more coming up on the legislature today. Good evening, I'm Ashton Mara. Members of the House of Delegates approved a bill last week that would allow West Virginians over the age of 21 to carry a concealed weapon without a permit. The bill would also allow 18 to 21 year olds to go through the current licensing process, something not allowed for the group under the state law now. The constitutional carry bill is now in the hands of the Senate Judiciary Committee, who heard today from members of the public both for and against the provision. With the push of that green button, you told nearly one million lawful gun owners in West Virginia that you believed in them. Art Tom is a lobbyist for the CDL, the Citizens Defense League. Members of the CDL describe themselves as the state's largest grassroots pro-gun lobbying group. And on Monday, a number of their members attended a public hearing held by the Senate Judiciary Committee focused on House Bill 4145. The bill would allow West Virginians of a certain age to carry a concealed weapon without a permit, something currently required by state law. But along with that permit comes a cost, a cost for the license and the state required training. Self-defense was what many supporters of the legislation cited as their top priority, including several women. Joanna Kirkpatrick spoke on behalf of not just women, but also the low-income and disabled West Virginians she works with as a licensed social worker. What I'm asking is that those of you who have concerns about voter ID laws for uh, not being able to afford a, a, a state ID would support this bill for the very same reason. These are law-abiding citizens who are not otherwise prohibited from carrying a pistol. But not only is it the cost of carrying a pistol, leaving your home, going to the sheriff's office, to a state sanction class, getting all of these things together, and getting additional training. These are resourceful, responsible people who will find ways to get training whether or not they're paying the full fee. So I would ask you to consider that today and just show these people that their lives are as valuable as yours. On the Senate floor, Senator Craig Blair of Berkeley County spoke in support of the bill. It's my understanding that there's over 300,000 concealed carries in the state of West Virginia. So anybody that thinks that they're worried about everybody being armed, well, when you got 1.8 million people and there's 300,000 concealed carry permits right now, somebody's carrying wherever you're at whatever the restaurant is, and frankly, I feel safer when the good guys got the gun and not the bad guys. But West Virginia Association but of Counties lobbyist Frank Hartman had a response for the senator's concerns. We can't as a society just hope that everybody knows what they're doing. The whole fundamental premise of a good guy with a gun stopping a bad guy with a gun is that the good guy knows what they're doing. So Hartman says his group, which includes the Sheriff's Association and the Prosecuting Attorneys Association, is in favor of getting rid of the fees, but keeping the safety course requirement in place. Yeager Airport Police Chief and 24-year veteran of the St. Albans Police Force, Joe Crawford, asked senators to consider two amendments. Put some language in there about the declaration. If a law enforcement officer approaches you, there ought to be language in there where they have to declare to that law enforcement officer that they're carrying a weapon. Even though we may assume, 
We may know because here's, here's where it gets sticky. If they don't declare, then there's a violation and we can charge them. The other piece is state residents. Crawford believes only residents of the state of West Virginia should be allowed to carry concealed without a permit, not residents traveling through or visiting from other states. Members of the Senate Judiciary Committee were scheduled to discuss the bill during their afternoon meeting today, but it was pulled from the agenda at the meeting's start without a reason. A bill to allow ride-sharing companies to operate in West Virginia has been revived in the House of Delegates after dying in the chamber last year. Some blame the bill's failure on included protections for the LGBTQ community, but as Liz McCormick reports, a similar bill was approved today in the House. For the past two sessions, members of the legislature have referred to the proposed legislation as the Uber Bill. The ride-sharing company serves 28 states and Washington, D.C., and the legislation would make West Virginia state number 29 on that list. Last year, the legislature tried to pass a similar bill, but it died in the House over some non-discrimination language. The bill had passed unanimously in the Senate. This year, only one member of the House spoke against the legislation. Delegate John Kelly is a Republican from Wood County. He says while the bill could bring jobs into the state, he thinks it will hurt taxi companies. There is direct competition. Both of these industries provide the same thing. They provide rides for people to go to different places within a community. Now let's compare a little bit. That taxi has to have a meter that tells how many miles you go and what the fare is. Uber doesn't have to have that. Delegate Eric Nelson explained the smartphone app that allows a rider to hail an Uber driver shows the price for the ride before a rider agrees to it. Delegate Erica Storch is a Republican from Ohio County. She supported the bill that she says allows a company to operate that caters to a new generation of consumers. I think that to have students that are so used to going to their phone have the opportunity to pull up an app such as Uber or Lyft and see that they can get a ride, be where they need to be, pay. It's all handled in one place that they're so used to going. Majority Leader Daryl Coles of Morgan County is the lead sponsor of the bill. He says there are three reasons why the bill would help West Virginia. Number one is that it's safe, reliable transportation. Uh, West Virginia should join the 300 cities and 27 other states that allow business travelers and tourists options like Uber and Lyft. But secondly, employment and jobs. The, uh, the TNCs provide additional opportunities for employment for seniors, uh, young students, uh, veterans. The third is DUI reductions. There's been a marked uh, reduction in DUIs in cities where Uber has been, uh, been allowed. House Bill 4228 passed 95 to 2 and now moves to the Senate for its consideration. For the legislature today, I'm Liz McCormick in the House. <coughs> Late last week, members of the House of Delegates also approved a bill to create the West Virginia Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And since, many businesses across West Virginia have made their opposition to the measure known through social media and their own local advertising. The bill now sits in the Senate. Here to discuss the bill this evening is Jill Rice with Opportunity West Virginia and Alan Witt, President of the Family Policy Council of West Virginia. Thank you both for being here. Happy to be here. Welcome. So I want to start just real briefly by explaining what your organizations are and what they do. Jill, why don't you start? Opportunity West Virginia is a growing bipartisan movement committed to growing diversity and inclusion in West Virginia, and more importantly, or as importantly, growing economic development. We are committed to recruiting and retaining a talented diver and diverse workforce in West Virginia and understanding that economic development and diversity go hand in hand. So Alan, what does the Family Policy Council do? Uh, well, we're, we're the state's largest organization that defends faith, family, and freedom uh, down at the legislature. We are registered lobbyists, but uh, we also do education and prepare the, the pieces of legislation that we believe promote uh, the best interest of uh, faithful individuals, churches, and those who uh, enjoy individual freedom in West Virginia. So let's start with the West Virginia Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Jill, why is your group so interested in this bill? We're very interested in it because we have a concern that it sends the wrong message to businesses. West Virginia, our West Virginia legislature has been working very, very hard to open West Virginia for, 
for business. We've been working very hard to send a message that we want companies to invest here. 97% of Fortune 500 companies have strong diversity and inclusion policies. And by sending a message that this RIFRA bill is one that really promotes a license to discriminate, we're sending the wrong message to those companies who we want to do business here. So Alan, your group supports this bill. Uh, yes, we do. The bill doesn't do any of the things that um, that Jill just uh, stated that they might do. The bill actually simply provides a fair balancing test which allows a framework for any judge or any court to d resolve a dispute sometime in the future if, if one ever arose. So my understanding of the bill is just that. We see Delegate Schott explain this bill on the floor We've seen him explain it a couple of times now that it sets up a judicial test for when states, or excuse me, for when the state level, cities, county governments infringe on somebody's religious freedoms. Alan, why do we hear that conversation then go wider to things like discrimination? Well, as, as professional lobbyists, uh, Jill understands this. Um, we move issues sometimes not based on the reality of what they are, but on what we can. Uh, influence individuals in the general public to believe that they are. And one of the biggest motivators we have is fear. So 21 states have this legislation, including the federal government, and on its merits, the bill will pass overwhelmingly, as we saw in the House with 72 votes. Unless there's fear mongering, uh, the bill will become law. Jill, what's your response? I want to talk about fear, and I want to talk about te the test. First of all, the test that's advocated and promoted in this bill is the strict scrutiny test, and it's a legal standard. It's the highest legal standard available under our law. It puts state and local governments in this law at a huge disadvantage by placing a heavy presumption of, the, of invalidity against the of state action, of invalidity of the state action. That's important because you're placing the, our state and local governments at a disadvantage under the law. So to say that it's a simple balancing test is really erroneous and misleading because, again, it's contrary and, and it favors the individual over our state and local governments. But I want to talk about the fear issue. We don't need this bill, and we don't need this bill because the religious freedoms that we are promoting under this bill that we've heard at the legislature are already protected. They're protected under the United States Constitution, they're protected under our state constitution, and they're protected under the West Virginia Human Rights Act. The promotion of this bill has been driven by fear. We've, we have serious issues in West Virginia that we should be discussing. We should be talking about a $350 million budget deficit. We should be talking about the decline of our coal industry and replacing the money that we're losing from severance taxes. We should be talking about our crumbling infrastructure. And we are talking now about religious freedom being restored that don't need to be restored. They are already protected under protections that we already have. Yeah, Alan, I think we hear this argument on the floor a lot that we don't need this bill, that we our religious freedoms are already protected by all of these other things. Is it that simple? It can't be that simple if 21 other states have gone through this process and the federal government believed that it was necessary to codify it in law to set up a standard uh, in the event that two individuals can't work out a disagreement. But I agree with Jill, we do need to talk about some other things, some financial things, uh, especially what happens to a state when they pass RIFRA. The top five economic development states in the country all already have these protections. When Texas passed it, they grew by 8.8 percent the next year. Oklahoma, similar numbers. Illinois, their tourism went through the roof, 11.8 percent growth the very next year. And we saw that very same thing happen in Indiana last year. They set their all-time record for rooms rented and uh, conventions scheduled, an economic impact of $1 billion to Indiana, despite the misinformation that we all heard across the country. How could that be? Jill, I saw you shaking your head. I did, I did. The AP reported just a couple of weeks ago that Indiana pulled 12 conventions that ref that declined to host uh, their meetings in Indiana. In, in Indiana lost $60 million as a result in part of the passage of RIFRA. Um, in April following Indiana's last legislative session, the state of Indiana's tourism industry had to hire a global public relations firm to rebuild the image of Indiana as a result of the passage of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act in Indiana. 
This is precisely the reason Opportunity West Virginia is interested in this bill. We are trying to grow the economy here in West Virginia. We're trying to grow jobs. Our organization consists of, of utilities and um, hospitals and organizations that want to recruit and retain t a talented workforce, innovators, job creators. And this is precisely the, the issue that we're talking about, the image of our state, who we are as a people. Alan, I'm going to give you the last 30 seconds. Well, we have about 73% of our region are young people with, um, the, who happen to have uh, a sincerely held religious belief in something. And those individuals perhaps live just across the border in Kentucky or in Ohio or in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And each and every one of those deserves the right, if they're going to come to our state, to bring their First Amendment protections with them because all of those states already protect their right in with a RIFRA, and it's just too dangerous right now for them to cross the line and work in West Virginia. So we need to fix that here. Alan Witt, Jill Rice, thank you both for being here. Thank you. Tonight we meet a group of delegates from the Charleston area in this edition of Meet Your Lawmaker. Andrew Byrd is a Democrat from Kanawha County. Elected in 2014, he represents the state's 35th House of Delegates District, one of the largest districts in the state. John McCuskey was elected to the House of Delegates in 2012. A Republican, he represents the state's 35th House of Delegates District from Kanawha County. Delegate McCuskey serves as the chair of both the Insurance Committee and the Committee on Enrolled Bills. He's the son of former Supreme Court Justice and House of Delegates member John F. McCuskey. Eric Nelson represents the state's 35th House of Delegates District as a Republican. Elected in 2010, he's from Kanawha County. Delegate Nelson chairs the House Finance Committee and served as the co-chair of the Interim Joint Select Committee on Tax Reform. Chris Stansberry is a Republican from Kanawha County. He represents the state's 35th House District and was elected in 2014. Delegate Stansberry is a former Eagle Scout and in his spare time enjoys restoring old cars and trucks. As lawmakers continue to debate social issues like religious freedoms and gun rights, members of the minority party have continued to call for fixes to the ailing budget of the state public employee health insurance system. But Republican leaders maintain the funding problem is one to worry about in the 2017 budget, something that can wait until the end of the session. Rob Engel has more. The West Virginia AFL-CIO called attention to the Public Employees Insurance Agency, or PEIA, funding issue during a press conference at the Capitol Monday. The union represents a number of public employees, including teachers, county and municipal employees, and communications workers, among others. As the state budget has declined over the past few years, PEIA recipients have had to endure cuts to their benefits and increased costs. Joshua Sword is the secretary treasurer for the West Virginia AFL-CIO. Today is the 34th day of the 2016 regular legislative session, which is over halfway through the 60-day session, and the legislative leadership hasn't had one serious public discussion about funding PEIA for the 2017 plan year. Sword suggests lawmakers look at increasing dedicated revenues to fund the program. However, Republican leadership, including House Finance Chairman Delegate Eric Nelson, has repeatedly said funding for PEIA is not an issue in the 2016 budget and promises the cuts would be addressed in the 2017 budget year. Nelson says PEIA will be discussed in more depth near the end of the legislative session once lawmakers have dealt with the 2017 2016 budget gap. For the legislature today, I'm Rob Engel at the Capitol.
Today was Corrections Day at the legislature, a day when lawmakers recognize the work state corrections officers put in on a daily basis. Talk in both chambers focused on the low rate of pay these men and women receive compared to surrounding states. But before you can officially start work in the state's prison system, corrections officers have to spend time at the West Virginia Department of Military Affairs and Public Safety Professional Development Center. Clark Davis spent time at the facility and has this report. At the Professional Development Center in Glenville, in Gilmer County, cadets go through agility training drills on a regular basis. Cheered on by their instructors and fellow cadets, trainees have to complete the strenuous test and obstacle course in under three minutes. The obstacle course is designed to simulate some of the circumstances a corrections officer may encounter while working in the state prison and jail system. Garrett Powell is a cadet at the facility. When I first came into the regional jail authority, the physical test was more along the lines of push-ups, sit-ups, how, how you know, high you can jump. The agility test really opened it up to help ensure that you know, we are physically fit. As you saw, there is jumping involved, there's being able to pick things up on the fly. The facility works to train those working in the regional jail system, juvenile services, and division of corrections. Usually a few months after being hired and after undergoing initial training, Officers come to the facility for six weeks of cadet training. Bill Canterbury is director of training for the West Virginia Regional Jail Authority. He explains the academy serves many different roles for the state's correction system. The professionalism that's learned here, we want them to go back and we want them to instill the professionalism in the cadets that haven't been here and, and our employees that have not been through the academy yet. During their six week training period, cadets also take on classroom work psychological training that forces them to learn how to talk with inmates and training on how to deal with an inmate that's past the state of talking it out. That's what the edged weapon defense training course is for. The course prepares officers to defend themselves against an inmate with a knife or knife-like object. How do they do this? Using a fake knife that has shock points built in, giving the person receiving the imitated slash a shock. The main goal is to take the knife away or be able to put the prisoner in a position where the knife cannot be used while waiting on other officers to come with help. Rachel Rimley is a cadet and counselor in the prison system, but says she appreciates the training because she says you never know what could happen. There's always a situation because there's there are times whenever I'm going to be alone with a, with an inmate in my office, so there's always that situation where, hey, this could happen. So it's good to get the experience just in case I need it. Ron Casto is Deputy Director of Training for the West Virginia Division of Corrections. He says each of the various training techniques is important for officers who are asked to work in a completely secluded culture. We work in a closed door society. Uh, every day we go to work, the doors close behind us and the only people that get access to those facilities or the profession are the ones that we allow. Um, it's not because we would like we, we like it that way. It's because the, the nature of our job and the commitment that we have to public service. Director of Training Bill Canterbury agreed. He wants his cadets to be well-rounded when they leave their cadet training. We really have to train our people up on the front end because we're there only the third of the time that the inmate is there. Um, the main our main training with our staff is how can we do this without having to use our brawn. We want to use our brain to take care of our situations. Um, anytime that we can, we can talk and de-escalate the situation, that's where we want to go. But the stresses of a job that secludes an officer from the outside world can be tough. There's, there's lots of times there's no black and white. Uh, you're constantly having to, to make decisions. In some instances, those decisions uh, uh, on the extreme side, but, but it happens, our life and death. Uh, there's a lot of sacrifices that have to be made. We have posts that have to be covered 24 hours a day, uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas Eve, uh, things of that nature that will keep people away from home. Um, and uh, it's, it can be quite stressful. Um, average uh, life expectancy of a correctional officer is somewhere between 56 to 57 years. There's added stress for West Virginia Corrections officers, though. They're some of the lowest paid in the region. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, West Virginia COs make $16 an hour on average. 
compared to $20 an hour in Virginia, or $24 in Pennsylvania. Lawmakers have discussed raises for correctional officers during the last few legislative sessions. But with this year's budget struggles, it remains to be seen if a pay raise is in their future. For West Virginia Public Broadcasting, I'm Clark Davis in Gilmer County. Tomorrow on our show, a new report from the West Virginia Center on Budget and Policy details the underlying factors its authors believe are driving the state's continued budget gaps. West Virginia Center on Budget and Policy Executive Director Ted Bettner joins us tomorrow to discuss the report. This has been the Legislature Today. I'm Ashton Mara. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Support for the legislature today is provided by the following. West Virginia University, online at wvu.edu. AARP West Virginia, your ally for real possibilities in the Mountain State. Online at aarp.org wv. The West Virginia Higher Education Policy Commission, working to double the degrees produced annually in our state by 2025 through increased opportunities for West Virginians to earn the credentials today's economy demands. The High Technology Foundation, building a stronger West Virginia, online at wvhtf.org. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting.